So I'm Kamil Afsar, uh, and this is my colleague uh, Sahan Aydin. We work at the company Q42. We're almost all uh, engineers, uh, so programmers, a uh, few exceptions aside. And uh, we do all kinds of things uh, connected with the internet. For instance, uh, we made the last uh, uh, um, iPad app for Foxconn. Uh, but also another thing we're very proud of, uh, we made the uh, infrastructure of uh, Philips Hue. Um, but today we're going to talk about AI and uh, a special kind of AI, voice AI as we call it. And we're very excited about this new technology and we think it's the future. As we have seen in movies already, uh, 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 scenario writers have uh, thought about this concept of talking to machines decades ago and um, uh, what we like about it is that um, it, it makes really the, the, um, uh, the technology accessible uh, for people. You don't have to learn anything, you can interact with the language you already learned from when you were a baby and that's the future. But of course we are not there yet. So C3PO looks a bit more like this uh, today, and it's already handy. But uh, uh, so, just a quick poll: Who has a smart speaker at home? Uh, a few hands. And uh, two and a half years ago, uh, we did our first Alexa app, and it uh, worked like this. Hey Alexa, open Juke. Welcome back. What radio station would you like me to uh, play? Alexa, play uh, Radio Veronica. Now playing Radio Veronica. Alexa, what am I hearing? You're listening to Sunny by Bonyan. Uh, Alexa, play uh, the latest news. You're listening to the latest episode of news. En dan nog weer van vijf jaar. Regen, regen. Ja, en helaas nog eens regen. Oh, Alexa, take me to Ibiza. Hey, we're going to Ibiza. So that gives a bit of an idea what uh, what it's all <laughs> able to do. And um, uh, actually, uh, we did this uh, around uh, about two two and a half years ago, and from Talpa Radio. Um, they told us uh, already a few uh, single digit per percentage of their web streams are coming from this device. So that's really big. And after doing this, uh, we did a few more. So we really got hooked. And they call us uh, internally also the voice boys. So <laughs> <laughs> it sounds fun, but if you have a, a colleague testing out Google or Alexa and saying a thousand times Alexa at the day, then uh, you get uh, frustrated. And we even made uh, pro our own product uh, in order to deliver great user experiences where our clients can add dialogues to their apps. And um, uh, one project where we are using this is uh, for the Efteling. So I assume you all know <coughs> Efteling. And this is also the the voice project we are most proud of, I think. So let's see what it does. Unfortunately, unfortunately it's Dutch. Goedendag, veilig afst. Mijn naam is Spiegel. Ik ben een boer van de Toverspiegel. Die misschien wel kent dat het sprookje bos. Welkom. In tegenstelling tot mijn boeren ben ik een hele slimme en zorgzame spiegel. Ik geef antwoord op een hele hoop vragen die jij als gast van Efteling kunt hebben. Laat me weten of er bijvoorbeeld inventaris ontbreekt. Of je een leuk sprookje wilt horen. Wil weten tot hoe laat de Efteling vandaag geopend is. Ook kan ik een leuke Efteling quiz met je doen. En kan je bovendien alles vertellen over Efteling zelf. Ik hang hier immers al een tijdje rond. Dus vertel me eens, wat kan ik voor je doen? Wie is de mooiste van het land? Och, heel mooi bent u. 
Maski weet je is, duizend man mooier. Of wat je soms een beetje stroopje zag. So hopefully that gives a bit of an idea what it does. And actually, um, a little bit of context. So the Efteling obviously has a park and there's a lot of magic. But in their hotel rooms and, and, and uh, holiday homes they are renting, there's not uh, a lot of magic there. So they asked us to come up with something to bring the magic there as well. Uh, and basically we built this custom smart speaker and we learned a lot about it, uh, and a lot, lot, about, lot about voice and the underlying technology. And we'd like to, oops, to tell you what the underlying technology is, and uh, hopefully you can learn something from it. So let's tear this thing apart. So what we know is that on the physical level, we have sound waves. A human is talking, maybe there's some background noise. And we have a microphone and a speaker. So sound in, sound out. And then there's some AI, a black box, which does something. And um, let's see how it works. So first of all, we need a way to know if the user is talking to the machine. And how, for instance, Alexa and also we and Google solve this is by using a wake word like Alexa or Siri and this way you don't need to stream all the things to the to the cloud the, the whole uh, uh, audio stream to the cloud because you can do this uh, locally <laughs> and also um, uh, yeah that's it um, so what we have now is a sound wave turned into an audio stream and then it's coming in in this wake word detector. And this wake word detector needs to be really energy efficient uh, for most uh, devices. Because it's running on an iPhone, for instance, or an iWatch, uh, or maybe on a HomePod. And because it's always listening, it's always active, it needs to be really energy uh, uh, efficient and also memory efficient. And how that's uh, uh, tackled by, uh, for instance, Apple, is that there are actually two uh, um, neural networks running. And I'll, tell, uh, I'll try to tell how this neural network works. So this is a recurrent neural network, as Ruud uh, uh, told us, uh, for images, convolutional neural networks are really a uh, great fit. But for um, um, sequential data, like an audio stream, uh, you have this thing called a recurrent neural network. And how it works, it slices up the audio stream into slices of 10 uh, milliseconds, which are frames, and then a few of those are taken and then run through the uh, neural network. And the task of this neural network is to signal the system like, hey, we heard the phrase Siri. And so how this energy efficiency is uh, tackled is there are actually two running on your iPhone. Uh, or your Android device, and one is uh, uh, has less neurons, so it's less accurate, but also less there's less computation involved, and therefore less energy consuming. And when this uh, less accurate one and less energy consuming one detects the detects the the Siri phrase, um, the second one uh, is kicked on, and then uh, a more accurate uh, uh, detection is done. And that way they can uh, make it really efficient. So when we heard uh, uh, the, the, the wake word phrase, we start uh, recording the audio. And then after a few seconds, or X seconds, we have an audio uh, buffer. And this gets uh, uh, sent to the next system, which is called ASR, which stands for Automatic Speech Recognition, which is a fancy word for speech to text, actually. And maybe you would think this of one big AI thing, but it's actually three models which, is, uh, which are involved. And uh, Ruud already told us uh, what a model is. And so the first model is the acoustic model. And this one is fed with lots of audio data, and the only task is to do a continuous 
probability distribution of which sounds are heard, or tones as they call it. So for instance, the user says spa, and then this model would say like, hey, 60% chance I heard an S, or 40% chance I heard an F. And then next up, 70% chance I heard an uh, uh, P, or 30% chance I heard a B, etc. And this, this is because these sounds are uh, similar. So it's a stupid model. It just says like, hey, I, I'm hearing these sounds. Then the next one will, uh, is fed with, uh, or trained with lots of textual data. And actually it's, it's kind of like a uh, statistical model of the English lexicon. And then um, it combines those phones together and just discards the ones, the ones which are not likely to be said by the user. For instance, the combination of S and B is non-existent in English. So therefore, that part of probabilities is just discarded. And then we are left with two probable words, which are spa or spe. But then we have prob uh, uh, words which are likely uh, said by the user. But then we have the next problem, and the next problem is also solved by the language model. And this one is also fed with lots of textual data, for instance, from Wikipedia. This <coughs> one uh, makes a statistical analysis of which words are combined <coughs> together um, commonly. And then um, when you look at these examples, for instance, the apple and pear salad versus the apple and pear salad, it sounds uh, similar, but from context you can know that it's more likely that we heard the last one. And this way uh, we can uh, predict uh, which uh, sequence of words are set by the user. So from these sound waves, waves we, have, we made an audio stream and then we detected <coughs> the wake word, then an a, a audio uh, recording is done back to the ASR, and then there's a transcription of what is being said. And then it comes in in the next system, and my colleague Sahan will tell you all about it. So um, what I'm trying to tell you right now is I'm trying to explain how we can uh, connect some unstructured text that we receive from the speech text engine and how we can connect meaning to it. So we understand what the user is saying. So um, to clarify this position, I would like to uh, start with an example. Let's say, for instance, uh, we are we are the four hooder or a queue, and uh, we need to build an app. And in our case, it's possible that the user wants to order a pizza Hawaii. If we were to be building a regular web application, there we as developers, we'll probably develop a nice button where you can order a pizza. The event would go through some logic we've built, and then there would be some output. For instance, we would tell someone to deliver the pizza and give some feedback back to the user. It's not much different when a user expresses their intention by speaking. So instead of clicking the button, they say, order me a pizza Hawaii. So how would we solve this problem within our own logic? We could, uh, in the most naive implementation, we could just use an if statement. For instance, the input is order pizza Y. If so, then let's order pizza Y. And that would work just fine. But what if, uh, besides order me a pizza Y, the user says something like, get me a pizza Y, or a pizza Y, please. How would we solve this problem within our uh, backend or uh, logic? As you probably can guess, this will not scale very well because uh, it's a whole green field for a user to express their intention by using a combination of words. And there's possible, it, it may even be impossible for you to capture every possible uh, uh, combination. So this is the part where the natural language understanding uh, model comes into play. And what it does is try to it tries to tell you what the intention is of the user, but you have to train the NLD yourself. <coughs> it exists of two parts. The first part is intent detection. So what is the intention of the user? 
And the second part is the named entity recognition. So what is the parameter that the user is sending us while expressing their intention? So what that means for us as developers is that instead of us uh, writing code like this, we can change it to something like this, order pizza intent. And what the NLU does is it captures everything what the user has said and it decides for you whether it's an order pizza intent or what is the opening time intent, etc. It tells you what the intention is. <coughs> and uh, so you've provided some training data, you'll say, all right, uh, users can probably order pizza by giving me this data. And NLU, please, please label these sentences. Thank you. Um, with the intent label or the pizza intent. And uh, it's not only about what we have defined as test data uh, that the user might probably say, but the NLU is smart enough to understand that whenever a user says something like this that we haven't trained it on, it will still match for the pizza intent. That's where the machine learning part comes in and we will still have a working logic. And there are multiple strategies by which a natural language understanding framework can uh, solve this problem. One of it is by using something called uh, word to vec And what a word to vec uh, model does, for instance, is it gets a whole load of data and it tries to create contextual relationships and it expresses these relationships based on where it places uh, the the words within a vector space. And it also tells you what the distance is. And you can do some real cool mathematical calculations about it as well, because there are vectors, so numbers. For instance, the distance between king and queen is equal to man and woman, and they're distributed in the same place as well. And so same goes for walking and walked, and swimming and swam. So if a word that we haven't trained the intent on would hit, uh, uh, something like the user would say walking and in our training data we said walked the NLU is smart enough to know oh it they probably mean this and they'll give you a statistical analysis on what the uh, how good the match is so let's continue does anyone understand how the NLU works right now yeah, yeah? One question yeah uh, do you offer a good off point to say from uh, from this point onwards, it's no longer uh, a good match. So for you, maybe a 9% match or so is yes. enough? Yes, uh, good NLU should uh, be able to provide you some uh, statistical threshold. Um, nine, uh, 95%, 90%, but it, it depends on your use case. So you should you should look at it case by case. Yeah, and you okay. can then cancel it if it's below a threshold or so. Well, it, it's not really working as canceling, it just uh, it's more strict or less strict in doing the the matching. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the intent part. So we know what the intention is of the user. But let's go back to the uh, uh, pizza intent. Uh, we the user wants to order pizza Hawaii, but our uh, client sells like a hundred different sorts of pizza. So are we going to create 100 different sorts of intents? So uh, order pizza Hawaii intent, order pizza salami intent, quattro stagioni intent. So how, <laughs> uh, how would we solve this? Uh, that's, by the way, that is a perfectly good strategy to do it, but it would cost you a lot of time. But you could also use a named entity recognition part. So what the named entity recognition does is when you train your model, you say, okay, this is the training data, NLU. Order me Pizza Hawaii. Uh, I have these kind of types of pizza. So these are your entities. And then you tell it, this part of the sentence, whatever comes in there, try to match it with one of the pizza types I've trained you with. So the next time a user says something like, order me a Pizza Hawaii, the NLU will not only match the intent, but it will provide you with an object probably, uh, where it will give you the full utterance of what the user has said, what the intent was, and what the entities it has matched with. So it's, you, you'll get an object that you can use in your backend and then uh, hopefully order the pizza. Um, so 
This data goes into our backend logic. So we are at the business logic right now. And now we have to send something back to the user because the user is still waiting for a response. And the way to do it is uh, by using something called text-to-speech. This works basically the same way as speech-to-text, but in reverse. So I won't take a deep dive in that. But <laughs> what it means is you create a speech text by using an XML-like format like this. And you say, hello, uh, text-to-speech uh, engine. Uh, this is where my speech <laughs> text starts, and this is where it ends. And you have to say something like this. And you can even go crazy with it by, anyone seen the movie Her, by the way? Do you remember the part where uh, Scarlett Johansson breathes and then he gets annoyed? Well, Amazon provides you with exactly those kind of uh, uh, features that you can use in your SML. So you can put auto bread. So it will do something like <sighs> <laughs> And don't use it too often. But you can, <laughs> uh, you can still uh, tune it like, uh, when we started with the Efteling, we actually used a text-to-speech engine. And uh, the first um, iterations, it was like real uh, like monotone. The voice sounded like a computer speaking to you. And yeah, so the idea was all cool, but then it started talking. It was like, welcome by the Efteling. <laughs> and so we had to do something about it. Then we really learned the, the fine tuning of SML. And you can create a real human-like voice if you know what you're doing. Because you can in introduce break times. You can turn up the pitch of a word so it will go up and down while it's talking. So it's, it's really cool. And it will, the text speech you provided, the XML format, it gives you a, probably an MP3. And you send it back to your user, and all of this, hopefully, in under a second. And that's the loop uh, of how voice assistants right now work, basically. So, but why am I, along with my colleague, telling you all of this? Because voice and conversational doesn't have anything to do with people who are front-end developers. Uh, we believe it does, because uh, at I, we believe that at the intersection of different disciplines, when you combine them, you can create some real cool inventive ways of making our end users more happy. And that's why we have collected a few small cases that you can look at and maybe it will inspire you to do uh, great work. So the first one I think is really cool, if it works, is, is Acer. Uh, this, uh, you, you guys probably know Acer, it's an insurance company here in the Netherlands. And they have a conversational interface at their landing page. So instead of me as a user going through a whole menu and trying to find out what I'm looking for, I can just utter my intention that what I want to find or that what I want to accomplish, I can just type it in and it will do its best to help me with it. So I think this is this. If done well, this could, you could really help your end user with it. I think that it also is one of the reasons why things like Intercom are gaining, or they're, they're gaining a lot of attraction a long time ago. But uh, it's, it's a real easy way to just ask a question, get an answer, instead of looking for it on a website. Uh, another thing is, another example is Angami. I've, I've, Never heard of them, but they're pro probably they're really big, and uh, it's something like Spotify. But that's not the point. What they do is they use word effect, the thing that an NLU uses to match uh, the st st statistical relevance of an event. They use that as a recommendations engine for their songs and artists, which is which is really creative. Another example is an article a loud reader. You can use the text speech part to implement a really simple way uh, for your end users to just listen to what you've written instead of only uh, read. And the last part is, I'm, I'm really uh, sorry that one of my Rijks Museum colleagues is not here today, but uh, this one was for him. <laughs> and the thing is, you can improve search queries by using NLU as well. And if you're real hardcore, you can use natural language processing. But um, I think NLU is a good way to start. And in, what that does is instead of you typing in a Rembrandt and then 
using all the filters to look for the oldest painting, you, you can just type mm -hmm. in the query of the oldest painting of Rembrandt, and it will give you, hopefully, the oldest painting of Rembrandt. And <laughs> that's it for the examples. I hope you've learned something today, and I hope it will inspire you to do uh, some new cool projects.